Okay, I guess we'll start at 7 o'clock. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the regular board meeting of uh, May 11th. I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask Patrick if he could uh, read us in the land acknowledgement, please. Of course. As we begin this meeting, we respectfully acknowledge that we are gathered on the ancestral lands and waters of the Algonquin people. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We also pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region, from all nations across Canada, who call Ottawa home. Thank you. Father, can you lead us in prayer, please? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God of love, we invoke your presence at this gathering of your people. Through the power of your spirit, renew your grace in us that we might see your presence in our midst. And hear the call of the gospel in the human need that surrounds us. You call us to join as co-creators in your work of sowing seeds of life. Give us your courage to bring the light of justice to those in our community and world who are suffering from poverty, homelessness, oppression, and illness. Give us a heart like your son so that we may affirm the immense worth of each of your members and so that we may respond to your call with faith, hope, and love. Amen. And we pray for our staff and students, extended family members, especially those who have lost their lives due to COVID-19. Please remember in your prayers the following person who has passed away. Walter Burningham, father of Carol McBride, executive assistant in the Special Education and Student Services Department. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And welcome everyone. We have uh, no student departmental profile this evening, no delegations, no public session. Can I get our approval of the agenda, please? I move it, please. Trustee Coburn, Trustee Woodard. That the agenda for the regular board meeting of May 11th, 2011, be approved as presented. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Declarations of conflict of interest. Seeing none, confirmations minutes of the regular board meeting of April 27, 2021. Can I have a mover, please? Trustee McEwen and a seconder, Trustee Moore.
that the minutes of the regular board meeting of April 27, 2021 be adopted as presented. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Unfinished business from previous meetings, none. Trustee motions, none. Presentation and consideration of committee reports, there are none. Presentation and consideration of staff or committee or trustee reports. Memo from the Superintendent of Learning Technologies re eSports at the Ottawa Catholic School Board. Superintendent Edwards, welcome. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, good evening. This year has been a challenge on multiple fronts. One that has had a big impact on student well being has been our struggle to offer pro social activities. Our presentation tonight will serve to highlight the innovative way that Kevin Kelly, virtual teacher and former St. Joseph teacher, Andy Castellaren, St. Mark teacher, and a host of other teacher volunteers have used eSports to continue intramurals and extracurriculars. You will also hear how eSport relates to curriculum and career planning. I'd also like to welcome Sacred Heart students Arjun and Mira Dixit, who will relate how eSport has been both enjoyable and a support for them. It is with deep appreciation that I welcome them to present to us tonight. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to present tonight on uh, certainly a very new initiative and, and one that about five years ago was not really being talked about as much, and it has certainly exploded uh, over the last five years. And in the last year, um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly moved the needle up uh, on this initiative. Um, I'd like to go over a few things uh, today, specifically uh, the approach that uh, myself and my colleagues have, uh, have taken to this initiative and, and trying to integrate it into our schools and grow it and to try to highlight how quickly it has grown and, and where we think it'll go in the future. I'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, to give you an idea and a background of what esports is, I should just tell you about my experience uh, myself. Uh, what I kind of uh, experienced was three or four years ago, I was in a supervision duty and I saw a group of students gathered around a tablet. Uh, and what on first appearance was them playing a video game. Uh, I walked over and asked them what game they were playing. They looked at me uh, like I was really out of touch and, and truthfully they were right. Uh, they weren't playing a video game. They were instead watching someone else play a video game uh, that was live streaming this particular game. And they were watching it the same way I would watch football on a Sunday afternoon on TV. Uh, the idea to me of playing video games for recreation and fun certainly wasn't foreign to me as a, as a youth. I was playing video games. I enjoyed them. Uh, but the idea of watching someone else have the fun and, and play it just didn't really connect. Uh, and it sort of sent me down uh, an exploratory rabbit hole, if you will, uh, looking at the world of esports. And at that point, there wasn't much going on. In fact, my search uh, led me to the fact that there was nothing in Canada, uh, aside from one school in Manitoba, that was running any kind of organized competitive esports league. Uh, so I, I decided that probably the best way to um, learn more about esports was to meet with the kids. Um, and, and I'll go over that as we go through the slide. But what turned out to be something uh, very foreign to me really started to connect the more I learned about it. And the esports industry has grown in the last uh, five years exponentially. And the forecast for the future is that growth is going to continue. I'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, our three-pronged approach to esports and integrating it into our school system uh, first started with our intramural uh, leagues, which are already established. And uh, not only are there a career pathway as well as an academic pathway that's set up in all of the schools right now, uh, but it was a great way to utilize students to connect with other students and to grow the, the notion that esports can be played in schools. And we didn't necessarily have to huddle around tablets and kind of hide from teachers on supervision duty when we were enjoying them. Uh, the next approach came uh, in our first interscholastic competition. I'll cover that in just a bit. Uh, but that has cer certainly grown. And actually, this year it has really grown. Um, and, and I'll kind of cover that as we go through. And then finally, the pathways. Okay, there are academic as well as career pathways that are put in place that did not exist uh, when we first started having our tournaments uh, three years ago. And the uh, careers and the industry that is uh, growing as we speak is going to invent or be innovative in the sense that there are going to be jobs our students are working in that don't exist today. I'll go to the next slide, please. For our intramural approach, uh, I think one of the things that we noticed right from the beginning was finding the games that the students enjoyed playing. 
Um, so esports uh, was a way of making video games less of a recreation and more of a competition. And with it came all of the great things that we can associate with organized competitive sport. Um, but in the intramural uh, method, we still had to make it as recreational as possible and as fun as possible. So we tried to find the games that most students were playing. And some of them were not necessarily the games that are traditionally played at uh, large professional esports venues. Uh, as we went through the intramurals, it was, it was interesting from a coaching standpoint, we were able to identify existing talent and existing um, students that were already competing in, in organized semi-professional leagues outside of school. So non-varsity, non-interscholastic, there were already students that were competing and some of them were just trying to find an outlet to compete for their high school. I'll go to the next slide, please. Now the interscholastic model, the first uh, iteration of it happened um, shortly after we, uh, I, I learned what esports was. I, I went back to, uh, to my portable and I sat down. I said, I got to put a morning announcement in and I'm going to see how many students would be interested in joining an uh, esports team for St. Joseph High School. Uh, the next day, uh, or sorry, uh, the next week we had a lunch meeting, kind of an introductory meeting. I didn't have enough space in my portable for all the students that arrived. Uh, I, I knew I had something, so the first thing I did was reach out to uh, to my coaching network. I'm traditionally a football coach and volleyball coach, so I reached out to Andy Castellan at St. Mark High School. Um, within probably a few text messages later, he was he was very much uh, on board and said the exact same thing uh, when he held his introductory meeting. There is a lot of interest that we didn't even know about, um, and that grew. So we ended up having our first uh, in person competition. It was a tournament held at St. Joe's. We had over 100 students competing when we only had three schools at the time. We had St. FX, we had uh, St. Joseph, as well as St. Mark. Uh, and what we noticed at that event was all the things that we as, as you know, uh, coaches in football or coaches in volleyball uh, could see when we're coaching from the sidelines of the football game or coaching from the bench of the volleyball game, all of those elements of sport were there. And all the things that we probably take for granted as coaches that we're teaching our students and engaging with our students to, to kind of help them develop skills for later on in life and certainly in line with our Catholic graduate expectations, uh, we saw it in front of us. So something that we didn't really understood existed before was happening, happening naturally and organically right in front of us in our gym. Um, and we wanted to grow it from there. Uh, and it really did start to grow when uh, we were very fortunate Jeff Edwards had reached out to us uh, both about creating uh, pathways, and we'll look at that in a second, but also uh, how can we grow this league? And, and we met uh, Jeff Edwards, as well as Debbie Friendo, as well as a, a great group of teachers, committed teachers to growing this. We met uh, early in the year, uh, came up with a model and decided to give it a shot. And it, and it really took off this year. And you'll see the numbers shortly. I'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, again, no in person, no problem. Uh, this year, we had tons of students that were interested. Uh, we had over 150 uh, registrants for our first uh, season. Uh, we also saw 14 schools in our board take uh, part, but we also saw interest from other boards. And in fact, uh, there are other boards and other organizations, sport organizations here in Ottawa that are asking us uh, kind of for guidance on this. So in many ways, we're, we're holding true to our strategic commitment to be innovative here at OCSB Esports. I'll go to the next slide, please. And then finally, Pathways. Uh, Jeff had approached me uh, two years ago about creating a pilot course um, for esports. And we're going to take a look at the existing sports marketing course and see how we can um, focus it and kind of filter it into the esports world. And, and, and what we learned is it's not only possible, there was interest there. Uh, our pilot program, unfortunately, wasn't able to run at St. Joseph this year um, due to some staffing changes with uh, COVID-19 and Virtual Academy. But we were very fortunate in the sense that other schools took interest. And next year, we'll have more than one school offering this course. Um, I know that Andy Stellar and St. Mark is offering it as well as at St. Joseph. And we're hoping to offer it at Virtual Academy next year as well. Uh, and from there, finding post-secondary study options, St. Clair College has created an OCSB, or sorry, an eSports uh, administrative, administration and marketing program that will be a certified college degree program. And there's also a varsity competition uh, that goes on not only at the collegiate level, but at the university level. So post-secondary esports competition is certainly something that our students can explore. And there's also professional opportunities post-high school. 
Okay, I'd like to now uh, go to the next slide. I'm gonna turn uh, the attention over to two of our competitors, Arjun and Mira that Jeff uh, introduced you to earlier. Arjun and Mira can certainly speak to their experience in the program. I'll turn it over to Arjun. Thanks, Mr. Kelly. Um, me personally, I just had a lot of fun with it because especially during this year, because we had COVID obviously, um, I'm, I like to play basketball, I like to play volleyball. Uh, I joined the teams at Sacred, but it's kind of just like we haven't had, because of COVID, we haven't been able to do that. And I like playing competitive games. I'm a, a big gamer. And then when uh, Sacred said that there's going to be a, a video game league, I was just pretty excited. And it gave us a chance to talk about, talk with uh, other students our age. So yeah, uh, Miri, I hand it over to you. All right, thank, thank you, Arjun. Sorry, some technical difficulties there. Um, I really enjoyed the um, Smash Bros League because it really gave us the opportunity to socialize with people. Because especially during high school, one of the best parts is being able to communicate with your friends, meet new people. And in, in class, you go through the stress together with your friends of like, oh no, we have a test coming up and you all study together. Like that's one of the best parts about high school. and. Because of COVID, we weren't really allowed to experience that stuff because we had to learn online. So I really appreciated the uh, esports team because it allowed me to make new friends with people who also had the same interests as me. And as Arjun said, I'm also pretty competitive. I play basketball and I enjoy these types of sports and I enjoy like the feeling of winning. And even when you lose the feeling that you'll know, you'll get that redemption next time you play. So overall, it was a really enjoyable experience. And yeah, it was very enjoyable. So back to you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mira. Um, I'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, I did bring my colleague Andy Casteller in here. Uh, he can speak to this, certainly if there's questions, but uh, what Andy is uh, the same mark. Andy pursued um, some some awards that were um, certainly available, uh, awards that would have allowed for uh, uh, financial support to grow the esports team at St. Mark's. But we were also very fortunate this year to have a financial commitment from our board, uh, and we're very grateful for it. It was allowing our, our, our league to be inclusive for everyone that was interested in competing, uh, and we're very thankful for that. I'll go to the final slide, please. I've included some images of, of what I hope to get back to. I'm sure everyone's feeling the same way when it comes to uh, what we've been living through the last year. Uh, we can't wait to start gathering again, but what I can say uh, is this. Uh, I have seen firsthand the experience of sports and the positive impact it can have on an athlete a student, but I've also seen firsthand um, how it can teach them and prepare them for life past high school. So not only post-secondary study, not only careers, but uh, simply living uh, a just life, uh, a kind life. And I've seen that happen in esports. I'm fortunate enough to have seen it happen with my own students on my own team. But this year as, as lead convener, I've, I've been able to see it with students from other schools too. Uh, and I think one of the greatest examples of that is at the end of an esports competition, uh, the typical reply or, or salutation is two lowercase g's and it stands for good game. And uh, there was a lot of GG's being thrown around because people were making friends, people were socializing, and in an age where we can't meet in person, people were connecting. Um, I told the students at that first portable meeting that one day our board, our, our school will host a national championship and we will host it in a large arena, not unlike what we've seen with professional esports venues. And I stand firm that that goal will be met. Um, by the help of a lot of dedicated colleagues and I'm thankful for all of them and their support as well as the students have committed themselves this past year. So I thank so I you, wanna, Mr. Chair. I do wanna thank our group for presenting and we're, we are uh, ready and, and available for some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions or comments by the trustees? Trustee Curry and Trustee Armstrong. Go ahead, Trustee Curry. Unmute. Microphone. There we go. I'm trying. I'm finally on. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Chair. 
uh, through you to uh, perhaps uh, uh, Kevin, um, uh, in the documentation, there were uh, some references to females and males and how, uh, I guess, males predominate, but that uh, you're quite pleased with the number of females. It, does gaming still pretty much a male bastion, or how did you find that the, uh, that the female representation was? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, what I've noticed from my own standpoint is it's not unlike uh, other uh, co-educational sports where there might be a little bit more of, a, I guess you could say, a push to make sure that there's inclusion happening. Uh, when we look at gaming and the gaming industry and the industry of esports in general, what we've seen is um, there is some disparities, but I think that's going to be solved at the high school level. I, I truly think this is where we might be able to uh, solve some disparities or, or, you know, disproportionate representation in sport. I think that's going to be solved here uh, with teaching our students uh, the right aspects of sport and also doing our best to promote. Uh, you'll see there's an icon in, in our presentation, Women in Esports. It is an initiative. It's a, a charitable organization, and it's something that we're getting behind not only in the interscholastic competition model, but also in our pathways model. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, supplementary, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, through to, uh, I guess, uh, Mr. Kelly again, or, or maybe Mr. Edwards. Is there any possibility, you mentioned about the uh, course that's gonna, the pilot course that's gonna, was hopefully gonna start this year, but next year it's starting in several schools. Is there any, uh, um, um, looking ahead to the future that this might become a, a, a schism uh, topic, like that, uh, that it might lend itself to that kind of approach? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I can, I can take this one. Um, it's, it's interesting because we actually took the marketing course and we co-opted it so that it would become something that would, that would affect the esports. There are opportunities for definitely, we could definitely approach uh, focus programs at different schools. And I do believe we could, we could take the, the schism on um, uh, our technology schisms and could just make a focus on esports. And it would not surprise me if at the ministry level, there are opportunities for esports in the future as well. It is a huge industry and it's only growing and there's great career opportunities across all pathways. That's what excites me the most. It's across all pathways. Oh, okay, thank you. Trustee Armstrong, then Trustee Moore. Through you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to direct my question to one of the students, if they're still available. Is Mira there? Uh, hi, yes, I'm here. Hi, Mira. Um, so, Mira, one question. Um, take your time to answer. Uh, can you describe the attributes of a top eSport competitor? Hmm. I take would say time. there were... A few competitors who were, I could say, the top. I can't say there was just one person who was the definite best at the game, but I would have to say all of them had, everybody had great sportsmanship, whether you were the best or the worst. Everyone's sportsmanship was great. Like Mr. Kelly said, there were constant GGs like everywhere. Everybody was super nice and kind. And I would have to say um, they were definitely talented. Like uh, the best esports players, they definitely had a lot of talent. And not to be cocky, but I would also like to say that I was quite good at e at, the, at the video game. But um, yeah, I think that the most outstanding trait that the top players had were just being completely sportsmanship and they were polite and they would give you like they would give you tips. They would say, oh, you can do this to become better. Like, oh, you're great at this stuff like that. So overall, everybody was like really nice to talk to. Just to follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Uh, do you play against your brother? <laughs> and who's better? Um, he's, he's, gonna, he's gonna uh, he's gonna argue with me, but of course I'm gonna say I'm better, you know. Um, but really, it goes it goes back and forth with us. Like there will be times where I'll win the game, and then there will be times that he wins the game. Mm. And some of his uh, characters that he play at, like that he plays as, are it's really good. So he's definitely also. I would say he's definitely one of the top players uh, on the esports teams too. Thank you. No problem. Trustee Moore. And thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. I think this is probably for Mr. Kelly. Um, I have a Twitch account. I have watched tournament games because my son was part of a college level one um, club. 
But my question really for you is about the game choices. They're not always appropriate games when you're watching these tournaments. How are you picking the games? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, what we uh, identified early on when we first started um, esports, and especially with the in-person model, was we needed to find games that were going to be friendly uh, for students of all ages. So that was going to meet the, uh, the parent rating criteria. We also tried to avoid games that would have certainly had excessive violence or, or any, uh, they're known as first person shooter games. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't include any of those, even though there are uh, probably the more popular ones uh, among students. I think when trying to grow something like this, we, we certainly don't want to scare off any anyone that's looking from the outside in. And then we hope to go from there. Uh, but as a committee, we met earlier on in the year um, and through uh, the guidance uh, of Jeff and Debbie, as well as the rest of the uh, teachers on the committee, we decided that, and Bob Thomas was there as well, we were really fortunate um, to come up with four games that we felt were not only appropriate, but appropriate for grades seven through 12, um, as well as the engaging games that certainly are recognized globally. Um, so that was uh, part of that process as well. And then we realized too, um, anything that we saw in the stream as we were kind of doing our research here, that we should probably, uh, anything that would kind of make us take a step back, that wouldn't be a game that we necessarily include, certainly in the beginning phases of this. Uh, but we're going to hopefully introduce more games as we as we go and as uh, as approval sees fit. Um, and, but we're always going to keep in mind that uh, this is high school sports and certainly intermediate sports as well. Okay. Do we have a follow-up? Go ahead. Uh, what game systems are you using? So uh, through you, Mr. Chair, what we've uh, decided to use and it was probably the most um, inclusive console that we had in the user-friendly console was the Nintendo Switch. Um, through a financial commitment, we were able to purchase uh, Nintendo Switches for um, all the schools that had registered, uh, which meant that students that didn't necessarily have that con console were still able to compete. Uh, we, we decided that was probably the best fit as well, because uh, one of the games was actually a free game that every student can compete with. And if they had uh, a Nintendo Switch, that was great. But that particular game, uh, Rocket League, was cross-platform, meaning you could play with a PC, uh, an Xbox, a PlayStation uh, 4, uh, any any console that you had, you could play that game. So that season had the most registrants. Uh, and, and we're hoping to kind of overcome any possible console or tech issues in the future as we grow the league. Um, but what we noticed was that was the most inclusive console. Okay. Thank you very much. Trustee uh, Simpson. Uh, just a quick comment. I really want to congratulate uh, Mr. Kelly. I'm a little bit more knowledgeable about esports, seeing as it was featured on CTV News two nights ago, and I was very impressed with how it is a growing trend. But most of all, I want to congratulate you in engaging students in a year of, of a tough time engaging uh, students. I have never seen Trustee Bennett smile as much as he did during this presentation, and that's proof in the pudding that uh, this is, uh, has been a, a great innovative approach, and I'm going to be very excited to continue watching the growth of this sport. Is there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, this is the point of the meeting where Andrew, Arjun, and Mira you come up and see me and I give you a present. I give you a gift card. So unfortunately I can't slide it through here. So your teachers will be giving you a, a gift card, an e-chapters an e chapters gift card. And uh, with our GG for a great game and a great presentation. Thank you very much. Can I have a mover please for the presentation? Trustee Moore, Trustee Armstrong. that the memorandum from the Superintendent of Learning Technologies dated May 3rd, 2021, entitled Esports in the Ottawa Catholic School Board be received. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you very much for your presentation. Item L2, memo from the Superintendent of Planning and Facilities, re 2021-2022 Capital Priority Submission. Welcome Superintendent Bell and Mr. Baxter. Thank you and good evening, Mr. Chair. We bring forward our 2021-22 Capital Priorities Plan for approval. 
I'd like to acknowledge all the work that our uh, planning and facility staff have done to prepare the business cases in such a short period of time to meet the ministry debt timelines. Our manager, uh, Ian Baxter, plan, uh, ma manager of planning and construction, will make the presentation of the capital priorities for submission on May the 21st. Ian? Uh, thank you, Superintendent Valla, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, on March 24th, the board received notice from the Ministry of Education regarding the launch of the 2021-2022 Capital Priorities Program. <clears throat> Previous to this one, the most recent capital request was in July 2019. You will recall that capital funding in the province is allocated to school boards for projects such as new schools and additions uh, through a process termed capital priorities. This is the only funding mechanism available to school boards in Ontario for construction that involves the creation of new pupil places. The ministry is asking school boards to identify a maximum of 10 projects that meet program eligibility criteria and are expected to be required for opening no, no later than the 2024-2025 school year. The request includes identification of child care centers planned in conjunction with new schools. The deadline for school boards to submit business cases to support capital funding requests is May 21st, 2021. Specific areas that the ministry will be monitoring uh, as part of its evaluation process include the use of repeat designs and modular construction methods, uh, the meeting of benchmark construction costs, the opening of facilities in a timely fashion, uh, and school and area utilization rates, uh, both pre and post construction. In response to the 2019 request, you'll recall we submitted six priorities for consideration. Three received capital funding from the province and three did not. Notwithstanding our continued support for all three 2019 capital priorities that were not funded, we once again received confirmation from the ministry that it will not consider projects that involve future consolidation and the completion of a pupil accommodation review. This means that although it continues to be a capital priority of the board, uh, the St. Rita and St. Augustine plan will have to wait. We will continue to work with ministry staff to convey our support for the project, our concerns with being unable to move forward, uh, and the need for a set of guidelines with which to conduct a uh, pupil accommodation review. When we updated uh, the board <clears throat> in the fall of 2020, we noted that in order to keep up with the growth that our schools are experiencing, uh, new projects would likely have to be added to the list uh, when we receive the next ministry call. We are recommending that four new projects be added to the board's list of capital priorities. A new elementary school in the Riverside South community, a new elementary school to serve students in the Mer Bleu uh, and East Urban Center development areas, a new Fernbank Secondary School, and a gymnasium addition to St. Isidore School uh, in Canada North. The map shown provides general locations for the six recommended priorities, areas of need across the system that are uh, more in the medium to longer term planning window, and where the board has school sites designated for future use. We currently own the land that would contain the proposed new elementary school in Finley Creek, uh, and have sites reserved for new priorities in Riverside South, Mare Bleu, and Fernbank. We have spoken at length about the importance of providing residents of the Finley Creek community with a local Catholic school option. This is an ongoing high growth suburban development that will ultimately accommodate over 7,000 homes at full build out. Existing school facilities to the north are not located nearby and do not contain sufficient capacity to accommodate students from the development uh, in the longer term. We've also spoken of the need to provide student accommodation for the growth uh, that is coming to the village of Richmond. A 10 classroom addition to St. Philip was included in our last submission uh, and continues to be required. A new elementary school in Riverside South was identified in the medium term timeframe uh, within the 2019 capital plan. Since that time, the community has seen a marked increase in the rate of development uh, with several large-scale subdivisions approved and built south of Armstrong Road. 
The designated elementary school for all of Riverside South currently is St. Jerome. The school is projected to have 765 students, a utilization rate of 152%, and a need for 10 portables on site for this coming September. With the recent rate of development expected to continue, student enrollment and the need for classroom space will increase. In order to ensure that we are able to provide local accommodation in a timely fashion, we are recommending that a new elementary school for the Riverside South community is identified as a capital priority of the board within uh, the 2021-2022 submission. This project was also identified in the medium term timeframe within the 2019 capital plan. In the past two years, development within the Mare Bleu community and the former Gloucester portion of the East Urban Center uh, has put pressure on student accommodation at the two elementary schools designated to serve these, these, uh, these two areas. Our Lady of Wisdom and St. Kateri are both operating well above full capacity uh, with enrollments projected to increase significantly in the near future. We are recommending a, a need for the opening of a new elementary school in the Mare Bleu area that will serve students locally uh, and alleviate pressures at uh, existing schools. A new secondary school in the Fernbank area was identified in the medium to longer term timeframe within the 2019 capital plan. Since that time, ongoing major developments in Canada West, uh, Richmond, as we spoke of earlier, and Fernbank have served, served to place uh, you know, significant pressure on space requirements at both Sacred Heart and Holy Trinity High Schools. We also know that secondary classroom pupil place loadings will be increased from 21 to 23, and a new coterminous board secondary school in Fernbank is now scheduled to open for September uh, 2023. Although these will have impact on enrollment and existing capacity, there is still a significant need for additional secondary school space within the community. Between both schools, there will be 24 temporary classrooms on site for this coming September 2021. That's a combination of porta pack classrooms uh, and standalone portables. As a result, we are recommending that a new secondary school is required to serve students in this part of the jurisdiction and included within our 2021-2022 submission. Finally, we are also recommending that a gymnasium addition to St. Isidore be included within our submission. St. Isidore is an important facility for the board in meeting student needs in Canada North, and the school's general purpose room is undersized. A new gym would provide additional space and support a full program of indoor activities and in play. As part of the plan, we are, also, uh, we are also proposing to renovate existing space inside the school to convert the learning commons into two classrooms. Uh, the learning commons would then be relocated to the existing general purpose space uh, to create a larger modernized student learning support area. If there are questions tonight regarding the report, staff are here tonight to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Questions or comments? Trustee Coburn, then Trustee Sexton, then Trustee Curry. Good. Thank you for your report. Um, I'm glad to see that there's an elementary school on the priority list for uh, for the Maribel area. Uh, my first first point is going to be a comment. The two schools that are currently in that catchment area are Lady of Wisdom and uh, St. Cattery. I would say St. Cattery is a reasonable proximity, but Our Lady of Wisdom is clearly not. So um, I guess my question to you, Ian, is really from a priority point of view, we've listed six priorities. Does the ministry look at that from one to six or do they look at all six and determine which ones they feel that they want to fund? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So I think we've talked about this uh, in previous meetings and um, really Brian, um, or Trustee Coburn, sorry, uh, the ministry really, and I, and I think it was borne out uh, with the results of the 2019 submission, uh, the ministry uh, really does its own independent uh, review uh, and recommendations around uh, each of the board submissions. So uh, I think I think the the rankings um, that we that are approved by the boards and submitted um, 
you know, are considered, uh, but really there is a separate independent review that is conducted um, uh, by ministry staff. Okay, thanks for that. I appreciate that. Um, uh, just a quick comment and question. I too, as uh, Trustee Coburn stated, I'm very happy to see a school being considered for the Maribel area. I also wanted to point out that there is a 96,000 square foot health facility going in and ready to open uh, this spring uh, at, the, at the corner of Maribel and Brian Coburn, which um, will have, uh, has a partnership with Rear, Champlain, Lynn, Chio, uh, the Eastern Ontario Resource Center, uh, geriatric psychiatry, the Services Bureau. So there's there's a, a large conglomeration of services that are going to appear there, and so I also believe that people will be moving into the area because it will will have services close by, but also there's going to be a lot of staff there. So I think I'm hoping that that will be in the consideration too. My my question is. Um, is there any utility, I know we've had these discussions before, about putting in fewer um, fewer priorities than having a number of priorities, because then it allows the ministry to sort and hunt and pack and let them decide which are the priorities rather than us? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I think it's a good question, and, and again, I think it's, it's also one that has come up previously when talking about capital priorities. Um, I think this board's, uh, this board's vision around the submission of capital priorities has been to, to make sure that we are, we are only requesting what we really feel we need uh, within that short time frame. And again, that window is really planned to be opened uh, no later than the 2024, 2025 school year. So, you know, we could certainly, you know, some boards will, will take a different uh, tact and they will submit, you know, submit projects that really they'll max out in terms of the 10 that are, that are permitted and um, they'll see what, what comes. Uh, I, I think that, uh, I think, I think that we, that the six that we have right now really are, uh, really is a short list. Um, so it's not that we are we are um, uh, that we are going beyond um, in terms of you know um, submitting projects or recommending projects that really are outside the window or not urgently required. So I think in terms of uh, in terms of your question, I think the six that we are submitting or recommending uh, are really uh, do represent sort of a short list or as short a list as. Uh, as we can, uh, as we can have. If I may add as well um, to to uh, Manager Baxter's uh, comments, um, our experience has been that uh, the the analysis that ministry staff take uh, certainly have a different recommendation at times in what the final outcome would be, and um, um, what we are working with uh, trying to do a bit of lobbying with our local MPPs um, moving forward. I believe. Uh, uh, the chair is going to prepare a, a letter to the to the MPPs to uh, lobby for our projects to make them aware there is a need in our community so that uh, you know we get both the the business case from the from the actual ministry staff bringing it forward to the senior group but as well some of the uh, the uh, the background pressure as far as the community piece so the local MPPs are aware of the needs so that uh, if in fact there is some conversations within our communities, uh, there may be some more, um, you know, consideration given to some of our projects. So um, it, it is a bit of an unknown, um, but they do look at the business cases. Uh, a lot of the analysis is based on, um, you have to have basically kids, bums in seats, ready to open a school. They don't do it on, um, you know, speculation or, or projections of development. And I think that the cases that we've brought forward all demonstrate a need, and I think they're all supportable, uh, you know, moving forward. So it is quite a few uh, cases. I'm not sure where other school boards sit in the province. Hopefully, uh, you know, we'll see, you know, a, a successful allocation moving forward, especially with uh, our expectation this becoming an, an election year uh, coming up, that perhaps there will be some, uh, you know, 
incentive to continue to reinvest into schools in our community. So anyway, we'll see how that works out, but we'll do it from both sides, from both the staff side and some of the political piece to help support our case. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Curry, Armstrong and Warren, I just got one comment that on uh, what Superintendent Dallas said. The letter, there is a letter going out to uh, MPP Roberts that is the MPP for um, St. Rita, St. Augustine's to say that although it's not on our list that it we have not forgotten about it and we would like to lobby him to lobby his, his co-MPPs not to forget us but we do understand that the rules say that we can't put it on the list because it requires a, a review by the school, in the school closures, which is on hold right now. Trustee Curry. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just, uh, I do have a question. I, I uh, just to, uh, as a prelude to it, uh, I think uh, the Riverside South and Murrah Blue schools are both, uh, it seems the, uh, the figures sure show the need for them. I uh, I think that uh, I'm so glad to see the gym addition, the new uh, gym for St. Isidore on the list. Um, to me, that's not only a uh, facility question, but it's a question of fairness. That, that school is is deserves a much uh, a, a gym the size that our other schools have, and for years they haven't had it. So it's a uh, it's a fairness. Uh, thing to me. I, I just, uh, with regard to the St. Philip edition, um, I think uh, uh, I, I'm in Richmond quite a bit and uh, I was, uh, I just got noticed today that uh, Mattamy is going ahead with their subdivision there. Uh, Caven Communities has built over 200 homes in the last year and a half or so. So it's really booming in, uh, and there are other developments, it's really booming in Richmond. So I think that edition is uh, justified. With regard to the Fernbank Secondary School, I mean, we're, we're talking uh, uh, the equivalent, I think, of 30 portables now, and, uh, and both Holy Trinity and Sacred are, are, are well over capacity. So I, and I, because I just want to point out in all this, this is funding for, what is it, 20, 24, 25 year? So the, the, the uh, we're already going to be two or three years in into the future and these figures are only going to get worse and worse so i hope the ministry takes that into account my question was in regard to number one priority and i i don't want to take away from uh, trustee warren's uh uh comments that he may have because i know he's been a strong advocate for this project and very frustrated that it hasn't gone ahead yet i just was wondering um Finley Creek uh, Elementary School was our number one priority for a number of years, and it's always been rejected. Oh, what, if anything, did the ministry tell you in their debriefing from our last uh, submission that would uh, that that has been that you've used to try to fortify this submission even more? I mean, obviously, um, I think uh, we do, we should have a school there, and I hope we get it. Um, but is there something that's, that the debriefing uh, led you to that you feel that this is an even stronger presentation? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't think the ministry in, in our conversations and uh, with the ministry, you know, after uh, their decisions on the 2019 um, submissions, I don't think they provided us with anything uh, anything, uh, any more ammunition per se. Uh, but I do think I, I was pleasantly surprised in terms of their, uh, their receptiveness uh, and their understanding of the need for the priority uh, and the project. I mean, I, I think they understand, um, I think they understand the longer term need. Uh, we're talking so over 7,000 homes eventually in that, in that Finley Creek Leitrim area. Um, an elementary school is absolutely required in the longer term. The problem is, and I, and I think Superintendent Valla spoke about it previously too, uh, is that it's a short-term window. These are always short-term windows. They're always looking for um, urgency of need. Uh, there's a pot of money across the province, and it's very easy for them to look uh, at the short term. And, and as you mentioned even previously, 
some of these cases that we're submitting are very good cases. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on the ground that, that is demonstrated uh, currently versus projected as well. So I think it's just easier for them to, um, to continue to uh, pass by making that decision. I think what we have to do is, is really focus on uh, you know, the real value to the community. I mean, uh, the, the problem, this is what prop, if, if, if they don't sort of make that decision and write the ship in terms of uh, funding a, a new school in, uh, for the board in Finley Creek, then what ends up happening is that pressures mount at the only school that is there. And they, they obviously want to alleviate those pressures and it becomes sort of a double down sort of scenario versus I think our argument really, one of our arguments really is that it, this can be a win-win. You know, funding, uh, funding a school for uh, the OCSB uh, can take care of two things. It can provide additional option, op another option for parents in the community, and it can also begin to alleviate pressures at the existing school that is there uh, with the coterminous school board. So I, I think again, that's that's one of our um, one of our arguments. Um, but it is easy. It's it would be unfair to say that it is not easy for them to look at the numbers um, and and fund other projects. Okay, uh, thank you. Just here, sir. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, for uh, Superintendent Valla, uh, just a comment. Um, with regard to the St. Rita and St. Gustin replacement school project, um, I believe that may be a burden to families with the uncertainty that comes with potential school closure or, am or amalgamations during the pandemic. I would like to thank Superintendent Valla for the time he has taken over the last week to sit down and fully explain in a detailed manner all of the prior priorities. And I fully agree with his recommendations. Thank you. Trustee Warren. Thanks uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I uh, just wanna start off by saying thanks for, for all the work you put into this. Um, year after year, you guys put a lot of uh, thought into this and it's not just uh, a wish list, but it's actually a need that we need for our school community. Um, I want to thank Mr. Uh, or Trustee Curry for, for basically asking me, I was going to ask the same thing. So you worded it probably way better than I would have. Um, but just to kind of, just to kind of add to that, our, when we're projecting what the school is going to look like at Finley Creek, are we, are we looking, are we projecting for the future or for the need now? Because my worry is that when we do finally get the budget to build the school, we're already going to be behind on the size of the school needed. And then there'll have to be portables put into there. So are we projecting what that actual, what that student count will look like in the future as though it's built um, and we get approved this year or? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I think what the trustee might be getting at is the fact that in a situation like this, once, once a school is opened, um, the share of an enrollment will shift <clears throat> on the ground. We, you know, right now with one school, um, with one school present in the community, that board that has that, uh, that presence is likely getting a larger share uh, than it would historically. Um, and uh, so the answer to that is that the, the ministry really does not permit boards to submit, uh, submit business cases and projected enrollments that, um, that include assumptions around market share increases over time. So um, it's, it's, it's a tricky sort of balance uh, and one that really, although it is not uh, we're obviously, uh, obviously the numbers that are submitted, our projected numbers include, uh, include future development and students generated from that development and the share that we have historically been getting. We make assumptions in, in that area. 
Uh, but what we also do is in the narrative uh, and, and in the accompanying documents, we ensure that that piece is, um, is covered. But what they are looking for is uh, really a net zero <clears throat> in terms of they, they don't want, they wanna make sure that the current and the proposed uh, number uh, figures basically net out at zero and they do not want boards to, uh, to speculate around future uh, changes to uh, enrollment or market share. Just a supplement to that, uh, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, so, based on the based on the uh, priorities that we're submitting this year, do we recalibrate those numbers based on enrollment, as though based on the numbers of residents today, or is this based on the original proposal that was created several years ago? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the uh, the business cases are always updated, uh, updated for for new information, for new rates of development. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much. Is there any other questions, Trustee Wood? All right. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, so, Mr. Baxter, you talked about um, our co-terminus board and <clears throat> the growth that they've had in their in their uh, Finley Creek Elementary School. Do we have any idea, like it sounds like they're at or over capacity uh, at that school. Do we have any idea what the coterminous board is or has been submitting with respect to capital projects? Because I'm just, I'm wondering if, you know, if they're at capacity and, you know, their proposal to the ministry is to simply fund a, a 10 room addition on their school, you know, the ministry could solve the growth pressure in the area by just adding some capacity at that school, maybe not adding our school. So I'm just trying to better understand what the lay of the land is and, you know, what sort of competition do we perhaps find ourselves in jockeying for ministry funds in, in, in an area that might just be a simpler solution to, to fund the co-terminus boards ask? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So it's a public document, right? We, we are aware that the, uh, uh, our coterminous board that does have a school in, in Finley Creek, uh, Vimy Ridge Public School, we're, 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 we're aware that the, their previous 2019 capital priority submission did include a request for a new elementary school in Finley Creek, a second elementary school. Um, and we're also aware that they have significant pressures at that school currently, um, well above capacity. So that on the surface, that's a very strong business case to get a second elementary school. And that goes back to, I think my previous comments around it is really, the burden is upon us to make sure that we convey, I think as you alluded to, that this can be a win-win situation. We can, provide, um, we can provide residents and students with another option, another local option, a school that will be ultimately needed um, given the size of the development and, and the community that is going to uh, result. Uh, and we can alleviate those pressures with a new coterminous board school versus a second um, public board school. You know, and, and if I may add, I think that uh, what uh, Manager Baxter brought forward as well is that the, the, the development in that area is going to need more than just a simple addition to the existing school in that community. So in full both build out, there's certainly more than enough room for two or more schools in that greater community. So I think that uh, would be very short sighted on the part of the ministry just to add a, a large addition to an existing elementary school and then still put a lot of kids into portables and not serve the community over the long term. So I think that the, the likelihood of them adding another school to the community is probably much higher than an addition to their school. At least that's my thinking on this or my opinion. But again, we'll see what the final decision making will be made and, you know, and what we can do to con continue to lobby within our community through the po politicians to uh, see if we can get a new school um, approved in that community sooner than later. Thank you and look forward to being part of that effort. And you know, it's difficult to tell when funds are scarce. So, um, Mr. Chair, just a quick supplemental, if I may. Um, given next year is an election uh, year, as was mentioned, um, you know, the election is next next June, uh, the fixed election date. So that 
you know, leads me to believe that the capital planning process would be sort of moved up in the calendar a bit, uh, you know, as the closure of this process would be sort of during a writ period uh, next year. So, um, you know, is our thinking ahead to that, you know, next year's submission, um, if the ministry funds a couple of these items, uh, would we look at backfilling a couple more additional items? Or would we try and to, I think, to a previous trustee's question, tighten up that list in an election year so we really narrow the focus and and simplify the ask to the ministry? So, so through you, Mr. Chair, I think the way I'll, I'll, I'll answer that is that we have six really, in my opinion, we have six, again, six really strong business cases. Um, but in terms of looking at the medium to longer term and the capital plan in some of those areas, I think really these six projects um, are likely, may possibly with the exception of a second elementary school in Fernbank. Um, and again, that's probably more in that three to five year window. I think these six projects are really a good focus for us, uh, probably at least for the next for the next iteration as well. Um, again, assuming that we that all six uh, submitted projects are not funded, which which is unlikely given the fact that uh, the pool across the province, the pool of capital funding is uh, I don't think has ever been um, sufficient to fund all. Um, all of the projects that, uh, all of the requests. Is there any other questions or comments? Uh, just as a, as a footnote, uh, myself, the Archbishop, Archbishop Dampus and Michelle Pierce met with uh, John Fraser last Thursday, the MPP for Ottawa South and his Southern border would could fall in the uh, catchment area for uh, a new school on Finley Creek. So he's definitely on board. Uh, we brought it up with him. I brought it up with him and uh, he's definitely on board at anything that he can do that he will, he will uh, push it forward. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your presentation. Very informative. Can I have a mover, please? Uh, Trustee Lawrence, seconded by Trustee Warren that the memorandum from the superintendent of planning and facilities entitled 2021, 2022 capital priority submission dated May 5th, 2021 be received and that the information contained therein be approved for submission to the ministry. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Memo from the superintendent of leading and learning reportable requirements for 2021, 2022 school year. Welcome back, gentlemen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're pleased to bring forward our annual uh, update or uh, uh, with the uh, um, portable requirements for the 2021-22 school year. Uh, Mr. Baxter will be making a presentation on our portable needs uh, in the coming year. Uh, Mr. Baxter. Thank you again, uh, Superintendent Valla. Trustees have in front of them a memo that provides, despite the, uh, the impact of the pandemic, we continue to experience an increase in enrollment. This is good news for the board. However, it does introduce some site challenges with regard to available classroom space. We've been working with schools over the past few months to identify needs, uh, attempting as much as possible to account for some of the uncertainty that still exists with virtual learning. 12 sites are anticipated to require additional portables for September 2021. Eight elementary schools and four secondary schools. A total of 26 portable classrooms are projected to be deployed. As a reference, last year at this time, the number identified was 31. The year before that, it was 27. Of the 26 units, 18 are identified for the elementary panel and eight for the secondary panel. The list of locations is likely not surprising. Most of these schools serve high growth residential development areas uh, that are continue to de continuing to generate significant numbers of new students. In a few cases, portables have been allocated to schools located in more mature areas 
uh, where classroom space is at its maximum and additional staffing is required. Seven of the 26 portables required for this year are new to the system and have been funded through the federal COVID-19 resilience infrastructure stream. The remaining 19 will come from our existing surplus inventory and will be moved from, um, from existing school sites. As is typical for this process, it may be necessary to amend some of the identified school needs as enrollments and the organization of classes are finalized uh, moving towards September. Again, for this year, there may be unexpected shifts in numbers uh, as a result of the impact of the pandemic on the need to physically accommodate students. Planning and facility staff will continue to work with school principals and the human resources department to manage any required adjustments moving forward. Uh, if there are any questions tonight regarding the memo, staff are here tonight uh, to answer them once again. Thank you very much. Questions or comments? Trustee Moore. Uh, thank you, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Baxter, I'm looking at the four portables going on to St. Martin de Porres. I, and I realize that this year, because of the pandemic, that you had a bylaw, some sort of a zoning bylaw was amended or or that, but it was a temporary thing, wasn't it? If those portables are still there in two years, if we're late building or anything, if you know, the site just takes longer to get prepared, are we gonna be able to keep all 17 portables there? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, we will. I think you're referring to a variance uh, mm -hmm. that was about a year and a half ago uh, that permitted us to put uh, 12, go up to 12 portables on site at that time. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, we knew that we needed additional capacity on site uh, to bridge that period of time to get us to the new school uh, and the alleviation of pressures at St. Martin. Uh, and what we've done is we've put uh, additional infrastructure in place to, I believe, get us to um, a maximum of 18 portables on site uh, in that range. So yeah, so the, the answer is no, we're fine. Um, and uh, we're looking to uh, ensure that we can get through uh, this coming year and the next uh, and get us to September 2023. Okay, good luck with that. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Uh, Trustee Armstrong and Trustee Curry. To you, Mr. Chair. Um, have there been any safety related innovations related to the virus in the new portables? Superintendent Bell. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, as far as new portables, they've got um, um, far better um, air exchange systems on, on the units than we've had in the past. And even through the Severus uh, program, we're installing 220 new ventilators in our schools, which you know uh, provide uh, um, better air exchange rates and, and upgraded filtration as well. So we've got you know basically an improved air movement in the new portables and with the ones that we have. So yes, there are some improvements uh, within those portables uh, as we move forward. In, in just a second, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Uh, is there anything on the horizon over the next couple of years with innovation um, to uh, protect the kids against the, the virus that you're aware of? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I think that, uh, you know, we've learned a lot of valuable lessons in this past year through the hygiene practices that we have with our staff, with our caretaking staff. Um, and it certainly is exemplary as to, you know, we haven't had outbreaks with our, our staff, that, you know, outside of the fact that there may be some congregation in lunchrooms. But generally speaking, we've been able to uh, continue to do a, a very good job with the disinfection side of things, you know, with products that we've used and, you know, we've brought in those, uh, those misters, those foggers. When we do have outbreaks, you know, we've relied on our caretaking staff to deal with, um, you know, we've had a viral outbreaks of other kinds. And I think that this has really done, uh, served us well for the, the actual management of, of hygiene and cleanliness. So uh, with the, you know, with the recent implementation in the last few years with environmentally green environmental products, a low, um, you know, al allergenic uh, response. So I think that uh, those lessons that we've learned will continue to carry forward. And I think that our classrooms will be as, as good as we can make them, you know, as we have in the, in the last year. Thank you. 
Trustee Curry. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Trustee Armstrong's question and the responses to it uh, answered my question. I was I was wondering about ventilation in the portables. Thank you. Sorry, John. Any uh, other questions or comments? Trustee Whitted? Quick one, Mr. Chair. Uh, just picking up on uh, the Trustee Armstrong Curry had mentioned the COVID resilient stream funding that we received from the federal government for uh, air exchange units. Are we investing any of that cash into some of the portable units or has that money all been earmarked for uh, permanent structures? Through you, Mr. Chair, there's two types of um, equipment. There's the portable units, which were the HEPA units that we've put into some spaces. That's a uh, different funding that we've had. The, the what we call CBRIS funding is actually dedicated ventilator units. So they're like a furnace that have air exchanges and, and filtration within them. So there's 220 new units going into the system. Um, and then the, the remaining ones have ventilation system that provide fresh air. So we should be in pretty good shape for the, ma the majority of our portables that they have improved make up air systems. Uh, which are mechanical air, so you're not necessarily relying on exhaust fans or operable windows. So that's that's the uh, the plan. So the funding is should cover off our, our air quality needs. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none. Thank you, gentlemen. I introduced you incorrectly. Your department, obviously, planning and facilities. Um, can I remove her, please? Trustee Wood and Trustee Curry. That the memorandum from the Superintendent of Planning and Facilities dated May 5th, 2021, entitled Portable Requirements for the 2021-2022 School Year be received. All in favor? Opposed? Carry. Thank you, gentlemen. Item L4, memo from the Superintendent of Student Success Elementary, re Environmental Stewardship Committee, Highlights. Welcome, Superintendent Montgomery. Good evening. So I am pleased to be joined tonight by Katie Lewis Pryor, who is the Experiential Learning Consultant and also co-chair of the Environmental Stewardship Committee this year, and Yolanta Kraviatsky, Consultant for Science and Technology, also with responsibilities for the environment in K-6. These ladies will share highlights from our environmental plan. You will hear about how we will how we have aligned some outdoor education work with the environment, and they will also go a little bit deeper on how we were, are responding to Canada's call to reduce single-use plastic. So I will turn it over to our presenter. Welcome, ladies. Thank you, Shelley, and thank you, Mr. Chair and Trustees, for giving Katie and I the opportunity to speak this evening. Can we go to the first slide? Thanks. The Environmental Stewardship Committee seeks to support environmental initiatives. We receive updates such as Eco Schools, OCSB Outdoors, Laudato Sea, and OCSB Earth Month. An example of a recent initiative in our OCSB Outdoors nature themed backpacks for schools to borrow and use for teaching outdoors. The feedback has been tremendous, and we look forward to being back in school to get more backpacks out. The committee also receives reports about recycling batteries from raw materials energy use within our schools, and other practices to reduce our carbon footprint. Next slide, please. The federal government is also aiming to achieve zero plastic waste by 2030. They are looking to ban harmful single-use plastics as early as 2021, such as plastic bags, straws, cutlery, plates, and stir sticks. The government wants to hear from Canadians and stakeholders on this approach to protect the environment from plastic pollution and reduced waste through a more circular economy. For this reason, we formed a subcommittee to enable OCSB to provide input to these regulatory process, to this regulatory process, as well as to model actions that can be taken within the board office and schools. We are undertaking surveys of board departments, schools, and, and parent community. We have already begun collecting information from various board departments about their current and future environmental practices. We discovered that board departments have already started to eliminate and reduce single-use plastics within their department and initiatives that they host. Next slide, please. 
We are relying on social media to communicate the campaign. We have used Twitter to bring awareness of the six items being banned, deliver facts, and have communicated to parents through the CSPA newsletter. We have also planned, we have we also have a planned pilot for secondary schools with an environmental schism program for next year in order to raise awareness among our students. In addition to Twitter, a web page was created and added to the environmental stewardship site with resources, links to articles, and facts about single-use plastics. This information can also be used within the classroom by teachers. Next slide, please. Now, another strong initiative has been through the Outdoor Education Grant. It has been divvied to support different aspects of our school's needs with a focus on mental health, equity, and environmental education. Back in March, we partnered with South Nation Conservation to provide a virtual sugarbush experience for all our K-6 students. This bilingual programming was tailored to support the science and social studies curriculum in addition to both primary and junior grade levels. In the center of the slide, you can see the poster used for the Outdoor Learning Ed Fund applications for our school communities. A total of 11 schools applied by the April 1st deadline. These schools are in the process of having their proposals reviewed by a committee involving elementary student success, lead in learning, and planning and facilities. A second deadline in the fall will allow for more proposals. Throughout this extensive process, a web page was created with resources and vendors for schools to help them get started with their applications. On the far right, you can see the brochure about Baxter Conservation, offering K-6 virtual field trips that was introduced early, that was introduced just recently. After many months of working of working with them and a solid continued partnership with Baxter, all OCSB students will be able to learn about the local and natural environment. There has been overwhelming interest as Baxter is almost booked up for the month of May and June. We look forward to expanding the program, adding sessions for grade seven and eight as we prepare for the fall. Next slide, please. At the last trustee meeting, the OCSB Environmental Stewardship website was mentioned. I would like to take the opportunity to highlight a few parts further. The new website offers K-12 educators a place where they can find ministry-related documents and resources for environmental education, outdoor learning, and any other environmental-related topics that will connect to curriculum. There are plenty of resources that can contribute to professional development for any educator. Recently, the K-6 Loose Parts brochure received a makeover with recommendations from planning and facilities. This digital living document is intended to help school communities with the use of loose parts and support the development of global competencies. Next, you'll see our recent OCSB Earth Month was toasted on the website. Katie will speak more about this shortly. However, I did want to highlight that the site housed all resources and information pertaining to the month, organized by weekly events where teachers could register. We have received very positive feedback about the design and the layout of the web pages. During Earth Month, we were gifted with a video from Albert Dumont, who was an Algonquin elder and Ottawa's poet laureate of Algonquin territory. You can find his video posted on our Indigenous teachings page of the website that focuses on land-based education. According to the web analytics, anal anal analytics for the month of April, we have more than 2,000 views on our website alone. More than 500 of these were on the OCSB Earth pages, and there has been considerably a considerable amount of activity on the pages that I highlighted above. Katie will now share about our highly successful Earth OCSB Earth Month. You can proceed to the next slide, slide please. Thanks, Yolanta. As the co-chair of the Environmental Stewardship Committee, I'm very proud of the reception of these initiatives, as well as our strategy for Earth Month this past April. Because of pandemic restrictions about gathering, we had to pivot our plans for the popular OCSB Fall in Love with the Outdoors annual conference. After our OCSB science consultants met with educator groups on what they'd like to see to support them, our committee decided to focus on Earth Month to share virtual opportunities for learning through a series of webinars, both synchronous and asynchronous, as well as provide many resources to help our educators. Due to the stay-at-home order, we were happy to have COVID-proofed the activities so that they were accessible virtually through 
the website and through Google Meets. Our cross-curricular approach appealed to a wide range of subjects, including science, math, art, Indigenous studies, careers classes, and many more. We work with communications to create branding, such as the OCSB Earth hashtag and logo. We started using them in so some social media posts in March to build excitement and on our website to launch the upcoming initiatives. We've seen tremendous uptake on the hashtag in the post, and this has continued into this month. We chose four weekly themes for OCSB Earth Month, Recycling a New Life, Trees, Birds, and finally Plants. These corresponded with different activities that were going on each week and were spotlighted in our OCSB Creates challenges. We also supported professional development by covering the cost for teachers to attend the Canadian Network for Environmental Education and Communication Conference. Next slide, please. The support from colleagues and community members in planning this month was fantastic. We chose initiatives and recreative resources that we hoped would appeal to a wide range of interests, subjects, and grade levels. For Holy Thursday, our team worked on activities that provided an opportunity to think about the resurrection, recycling, and how to create art pieces using recycled materials. There were activities from K to 12. The religion team created a great resource document for use throughout the entire month. Asynchronously, elementary students received inspiration through a recorded webinar by illustrator Ashley Barron that included a read aloud, a tour of her studio, and students creating an impressive work of art. And there were high school activities as well. Our OCSB Indigenous team worked with Anishinaabe traditional teachers to create a medicine walk that was accessed by 75 classes so students could learn about plants that First Nations people use for medicine. We continue our work with ONFI or Ottawa Network for Education on two live environmental career panels, one for grade five to seven and one for grade eight to 12, to explore the possibilities for future careers. And panelists were varied from the Canadian Wildlife Federation, Ottawa Valley Wild Bird Care Center, the Assembly of First Nations and Tesla, among others, and 57 classes attended or registered for the session. Lots of student participation. Other engaging sessions include a very popular birding webinar with expert Bruce Delavio for grade five to nine students, where they learned about spring migrations. There were live coding sessions for 37 grade three to six classes that Yolanta and uh, learning partner Carol Aubrey led using microbits as the coding vehicle. 22 grade three and four classes learned about the plight of sea turtles and 15 grade five and six classes did a thermostat lesson. It was very clear the STEAM learning would continue in many classes. Next slide, please. We received a lot of positive feedback on the initiatives, as you can see from the very small sample we've included. Educators appreciated the variety of activities, multiple entry points, hands-on aspects, and the community experts who helped make this month an incredible learning opportunity to dive deeper into understanding our planet. Last slide, please. And finally, here is a sample of some of the tweets we saw. There were many more from educators on the work that they were doing in their classes, such as read-alouds, learning about sustainable development goals, and experiments they were conducting with plants. We're looking forward to next year where we hope to continue the learning. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. And we're happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you. Comments or questions? Just here, sir. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what would a, a coding activity look like related to environmental stewardship? Could you give me an example of an activity? Katie? Through, oh, actually, I would like to defer to, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'd like to defer to Yolanta. She actually ran uh, some of these activities. Thank you. Through, through you, Mr. Chair, I'd like to answer uh, Trustee Armstrong's question. Um, basically, Coding can help um, in terms of, of solving problems. So using coding, um, in, in our case, we were using microbits, which is actually like a technological, like a small computer chip um, that we used to help solve environmental issues. So the coding experience that 
I led, um, Carol led another one with using, you know, creating a thermostat, which we find coding within our own thermostats today. Um, but the one that I did was helping sea turtles actually try to find their way into uh, the ocean. So that coding experience was creating a light that would guide our sea turtles into the ocean because of external factors today are, you know, we are losing sea turtles right now because of the current environment um, that our sea turtles, for example, are, are fine, are being distracted going on to land because of hotel lights and other lights that happen to be on, uh, on near, near the shore. So uh, causing them to dehydrate and so on and die. And so the students were able to learn about that prior to the lesson, then they were able to code um, a micro bits that they could eventually or hypothetically um, have near the sea and guide those those um, those sea turtles into the water and they did have some post questions to follow up with with the classrooms so um, because of that pre and post um, the lesson that they were able to do they were highly engaged and I mean that's just one example but I can definitely tell you more examples of how coding can be used in all kinds of environmental issues to solve those problems. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Curry, were you next? Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, through you, I think, uh, to Yolanta, because she uh, talked a little about it. <clears throat> it's the Outdoor Education Fund, and you said uh, schools had applied or classes had applied. Uh, we, could you give a couple of examples of what the proposals are, or if, if you if you know what they are. Yes, through you, Mr. Chair, I'd like to answer Trustee Curry's question. Um, we did have a, a few of them that, um, that have started to be accepted um, from our department, but it's obviously trying to get students to be outdoors and learning outdoors, whether it's learning, whether it's learn to be outdoors and to learn about um, whatever they would normally learn indoors. Um, but in a setting. So, for example, um, schools are looking to purchase logs for students to sit on um, because we do would like to have some more seating space or trees so that there's more shade. Um, they're looking for picnic tables. They're looking to grow more outdoor space where we can teach our, our students how to, to plant. So, for example, looking to have more garden boxes. And again, they're looking for little, just basic things like soil to put in them, seeds, and, you know, um, having that area opportunity to teach our students, um, as well as butterfly gardens. Um, those are just a few examples of what I've been seeing so far. Okay. Uh, no, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, supplementary, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Oh, uh, and this may be, uh, I think, for, for Katie, uh, you spoke of our Earth Month, um, and I know having these special focus months is really great, but um, how do you see, how, how, does, how do we sustain the enthusiasm and the energy that's, uh, that comes forward in uh, Earth Month? How do we sustain that so it becomes ingrained in, in our students' and our staff's uh, lifestyles? Through you, Mr. Chair, I'd like to address Trustee Curry's question. Um, I think there are some really simple things. First of all, we are actually seeing some of the initiatives that we've carried on continue. For example, we didn't talk about it, but we have a hashtag, believe it or not, called OCSB Tweet Tweet. And we're actually seeing students and staff who are um, continuing to learn about things, so for example, like the spring migrations, and still tweeting about it and discovering it uh, in classes. Um, I think also having the resources on our um, environmental stewardship website for teachers to be able to continue to return to them time and time again uh, is super helpful. And I think we just have to continue the planning throughout the year as well and have other initiatives um, as we return hopefully to some semblance of normal. So we are hoping that we'll be able to have some kind of event in the fall. And I know uh, through conversations with Atlanta, we're hoping for things like talking about uh, birding in the winter and continuing to do things like exploring uh, the use of micro vets um, because we've got these wonderful climate uh, action kits that we're going to continue to explore and uh, 
provide professional learning for our educators to use. I think there's a lot of varieties of, way, of ways to address it. And I think that also exploring figures like uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, who is such a powerful figure for our students to look at as a role model, or there's a lot of opportunities. Okay, great, thank you. Trustee Coburn, then Trustee Lawrence. Uh, great, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure who this is question will go towards, but it's it's about the uh, single use of plastics. So we've seen the progress that we've made with regards to a school board. So I'm wondering if you, or if we have a timeline as to when they'll be eliminated. Um, again, I know we've been talking about this for a while. We've set a committee to do this. You've shown sort of the progress to date. So do we have a timeline around when we're gonna eliminate single use plastics at OCSB? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'd like to answer Trustee Coburn's question. Um, yes, the federal government has mandated, unless uh, things don't get passed through legislation, that those six products that Yolanta mentioned have to be eliminated by January 1st. So the fact that we're starting this awareness campaign now um, has been uh, really great to get people to start thinking about what they can use as alternatives. Uh, and I suspect that down the road there will be additional uh, single-use plastics that um, will continue to, to be on the banned list. Great. Thank you. Trustee Lawrence. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think this is for Katie. Now, I've got to switch screens, so this could be a problem, so bear with me. So I want to read something. My question comes from one of the slides. Oh, hold on. Oh, darn it, I had it. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, here we are. Potential pilot for schools with environmental issues and programs next year to raise awareness among students. Could you say a bit more about that? Like, are they high schools? Are they elementary? Do we already have issues and programs in, in the schools? I should probably know that, but. Through you, Trustee, um, Mr. Chair, I'll answer Trustee Lawrence's question. Um, so we've approached our two environmental, current environmental schism programs. Uh, one is at Immaculata High School and one is at Notre Dame High School. And in my conversations with the two uh, teacher champions at that school, they're very interested in the fall and working on an awareness campaign uh, very directly with the students in the schools. We are awaiting a bit more information about how things will look in our cafeterias because that will help support uh, what the students can promote. And of course, depending on whether we're able to use our cafeterias in the fall as well. Um, but we're hoping that student voice in this case um, is going to make more of an impact and hopefully also um, we can use that to leverage other environmental education classes at the high school level as well. Great, thank you very much. I suppose I should have known Immaculata, but I'll blame that on the pandemic. Haven't been there for over a year. <laughs> is there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you very much, ladies, for your presentation. Can I have a mover, please? Trustee Lawrence, seconded by Trustee Simpson. That the memorandum from the Superintendent of Student Services Elementary dated May 5th, 2021, entitled Environmental Stewardship Committee highlights be received. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Again, thank you, ladies. Memo from the Superintendent of Student Success Elementary, re mathematics at OCSB in a virtual world. Superintendent McCumbery. Thank you. So I went and turned on a light. I didn't realize how dark I was. <laughs> so good evening again, Mr. Chair. Um, so tonight um, I am delighted to have Rob Kopp, Coordinator of Intermediate uh, Secondary Student Success, and Jen Flynn. Acting Coordinator for Elementary Student Success, both with responsibilities for mathematics, here with me tonight to share some of the educational tools and strategies that have been used this year to navigate learning and instruction in both a full-time virtual environment and also in a model where students have had to flip back and forth between remote learning and face-to-face. -face. I believe you will be impressed with the innovative ways educators have approached math this year. I'll pass along the presentation now to our presenter.
Thank you. Good evening. Tonight, we're going to highlight math in the virtual world. Next slide, please. So educators in our virtual program have been teaching online all year and have had to come up with innovative ways to engage and support students in their mathematical development. Our face-to-face -face teachers have had to shift back and forth from in-person to remote teaching multiple times this year, necessitating innovation and flexibility. Next slide, please. To facilitate online learning in mathematics, many of the tools already used in person work well in the virtual world or have been adapted to work well in an online environment. Our key grade one to six math resource, MathUp, is a digital resource and many of the student activities are in the form of Google Docs. Our supporting math programs, Zorbits, Mathletics, and Mathology, are already digital resources, so have also worked well in the virtual world. Some Google tools have been very helpful for our online teachers to facilitate virtual math, such as Jam Jamboard and Pear Deck, which I will show examples of. The addition of breakout rooms to Google Meets has allowed for small group discussion and collaboration between students, which we know is so important for math as well as opportunities for educators to connect with smaller groups or individual students. Next slide, please. This is an example of a math up activity. So on the left hand side, you see the activity and typically an educator would have that up on their smart board and the students would have the blocks in front of them to work with that activity. Of course, in a virtual environment, that becomes very difficult because the students don't have those blocks at home. So on the right-hand side, you can see an example of a digital manipulative that an educator can share with their students to make this kind of a task accessible. So the students are able to manipulate the blocks in a similar way that they would in person. And then to share their learning with their teacher, they can either do a screenshot and share it with their teacher, or they can share their screen during a Google Meet and have a discussion that way. Next slide, please. Um, two of the tools that I mentioned, Jamboard and Pear Deck, have been really helpful in the virtual world. So Jamboard is essentially a digital whiteboard, and so the teacher can use it in the same way they would use a whiteboard in their classroom. They can write on it, they can type on it, they can insert images, they can also use it to have students collaborating with each other. So students can all contribute to a Jamboard or they could each have a, jam a separate Jamboard in a breakout room and collaborate that way. The example you see on the screen on the left, that's a Jamboard that a teacher is showing just a math image and facilitating some discussion with the students. And then as the students are giving their ideas, the teacher's adding some sticky notes onto that whiteboard to record student thinking. Um, on the right hand side, you see an example of Pear Deck. Pear Deck is actually an add-on to Google Slides. So the teacher creates an activity in Slides opens it then with a Pear Deck. And this has been really helpful in terms of engagement, feedback, and interactivity when we're thinking about math. So here we see another math up activity. And in a classroom, this would be an activity that was printed and the students would write on this piece of paper. But of course, in the virtual world, students may not have printers. They don't have that piece of paper in front of them. So this is just one way that a tool like Pear Deck can make this activity accessible. So in the little animation, you'll notice that the student is able to actually draw on that hundreds chart. And then they're also able to record some numbers down at the bottom. So what's fantastic about Pear Deck is each student sees their own individual slide. They don't see the other student's slides. They just see their own interactive slide. And at the same time, the teacher sees all the student slides. So the teacher can actually monitor what's happening in real time and can give that feedback and can plan those next steps in the moment while students are working in real time on an activity. Uh, next slide, please. So we pulled a couple of examples of virtual math that we see around the board. Um, there's an example upper left of a jam board that a teacher has shared with students. Um, beside that, we see an example of a teacher using breakout rooms to have the students do some problem solving in math in small groups. And again, that kind of replicates that in-class feel where students would have the chance to discuss and to collaborate and to work with each other on a math problem. 
Um, on the bottom left of the screen, you'll see a couple of examples of how we've been able to leverage the digital world to run real-time class embedded professional development opportunities. So for example, on the left-hand side there, that was one of our partners at Zorbitz facilitating a live lesson with 119 primary classes um, just to kind of give a give an idea of how teachers could go about facilitating this kind of a lesson virtually. So I'm going to hand it over to Rob now, who's going to give us a 7 to 12 perspective. Thank you, Jennifer. And as we can see from some of the tweets from the intermediate secondary level, we have uh, teachers and students uh, uh, collaborating on some jam boards. Uh, we have our intermediate secondary consultant engaging in some coding activities within the classroom. We can see some Desmos teacher activities where they can collect evidence from students. And then finally, we see uh, students using some uh, 3D modeling in Tinkercad to explore uh, three-dimensional shapes. Next slide, please. So uh, at the intermediate secondary level, Equatio is one of our go-to tools. It's an extension that makes it easier to create and insert mathematical symbols and expressions, as well as scientific formulas when using the Google suite of products. Students can type equations, speak equations, handwrite equations on a touchscreen, or use a smartphone to input items into their Google documents. So over the last several years, we've been promoting the use of Equatio to provide accessibility for students with special education needs uh, for its text-to-speech and speech-to-text capabilities. So like read and write, Equatio is a tool that is necessary for some of the students, but has proven useful for all of our students. Next slide, please. One of the challenges of operating in the virtual environment is the ability to capture student thinking and provide feedback. So we've already heard about virtual whiteboards like Jamboard, allowing teachers to capture students thinking and interact with them in the remote environment. So these three tools that I have here are commonly used to capture student thinking in the digital math environment at the intermediate secondary level. So another feature of Equatio is their uh, product called MathSpace, which is a virtual whiteboard and allows the teachers to share questions or problems, collect individual responses from students and provide feedback electronically. When the activity is returned to the students, the students have the ability to toggle the feedback on and off so they can make adjustments to their work based on the feedback provided. A second tool that is highlighted here is the Desmos Activity Builder. Uh, it's similar to a slide presentation. It allows teachers to create math specific activities that run synchronously or asynchronously. They can gather feedback or they can gather responses from students and provide feedback. In a synchronous setting, teachers can pause the activities, control access to specific slides, or highlight certain questions or common errors. And finally, we have Pear Deck, which allows teachers to capture evidence and provide feedback, as explained earlier by Jennifer. Next slide, please. So we also have another product, which sometimes cause confusion. It's called MathSpace. Uh, MathSpace is an online learning resource that is available to all math students and teachers in grades 7 through 12. Uh, logins are set up automatically based on school board data and students and teachers uh, access the program through the staff or student portal. Unlike other software that only require final answers, MathSpace asks students to input steps in the solution process and provides immediate feedback at each step. So students can confirm that their answer is correct or their thinking is correct, or it identifies mistakes and provides additional support in the form of videos uh, or worked examples. Uh, the teacher dashboard will show student progress on topics or tasks and identifies it as developing, consolidating, proficient, or mastered when it comes to those topics. Next slide, please. So the global pandemic has required teachers to quickly adapt to new learning environments. Uh, a positive takeaway from all of this is that the change has demonstrated how digital tools can not only support but actually enhance mathematics instruction. The strategic use of technology is one of the key underlying principles for improving mathematics instruction as identified in the new elementary math curriculum. The shift to virtual learning highlighted the need for these tools where, while demonstrating the value they can bring and enhance to the day-to-day -day math instruction. So that's it for us. Thank you. I'll take questions at this time. Thank you, Rob and Jen. Uh, they shared some pretty impressive tools that uh, during this pandemic, we're seeing more and more and more teachers use, obviously. It's uh, very helpful to their instruction. So, any questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. Questions or comments? Trustee Armstrong. 
through you, Mr. Chair. Um, with does virtual pose challenges with collecting authentic assessments? For instance, on your phone, you can use uh, the PhotoMath app, take a picture of the equation, and you have the steps and the answers. Are, are you running into any difficulties with authentic assessment? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I would I would think that one of the educators' best tools in terms of collecting evidence are those conversations and those um, opportunities for students to explain their thinking. So, within um, from an elementary perspective. Within the virtual classroom, the teachers are having those opportunities to have those conversations, to have those small breakout rooms, to listen to them. And then some of the tools um, that we've shown tonight are great because you can see the students as they work on it in that real time kind of space, which is really helpful for collecting that evidence. Just a follow up, Chair. Go ahead. Um, so students are writing a test and they both have phones and they're texting back and forth with answers with each other. Is that a problem? So through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so yes, a lot of these technologies that are out there and readily available can pose challenges for assessment in the virtual environment. Uh, changing the nature of the assessment or the structure of the tests and the questions themselves helps to alleviate some of that. Obviously, we can't control all the settings outside of our uh, our observation. Um, as Jennifer has already alluded to, one way is to deal with that in smaller follow-up face-to-face type settings. So you can pose general questions and do follow-up face-to-face meetings with students to try and gather evidence. Obviously, that's a little bit more time consuming, um, but really it goes to the approach to assessment and what we're trying to gather from those assessments. And really, we've been working hard with teachers and students to try and emphasize the need to uh, measure or demonstrate their own thinking and learning. Um, and and that, that goes back to that academic integrity. Um, we try to emphasize, emphasize that with all the teachers and the students. But again, in that remote environment, there's only so many factors we can control. Thank you. Trustee McEwen and Trustee Curry and Trustee Thank Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to either uh, Jan or Rob. Um, are there some things uh, virtually that we've been doing, activities or resources or experiences that have surprised you and that may um, be taken forward next, next year or when we return to normal classroom? Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I think that's that's one of the really exciting things. We, you know, always kind of look for those those silver linings. And with the pandemic and the shift to virtual, we've really seen how some of those tools can increase that engagement. And we really see going forward, even when students are all back in person, that teachers will continue to use some of those tools because it's a great way to have students dig in. Um, things like the Jamboard where they can collaborate with each other, things like the Pear Deck where they might be on a device and can work through a problem and the teacher can see sort of what they're doing in real time. Um, we've definitely seen a greater uptake of all of our tools and even our, our digital math tools that we have that support our math program, we've seen a lot more use of those. So I think that will certainly continue as well. Yeah, thank you. It, it is rather exciting. If I could add to that, actually, one of the I, I forget who was next. Sorry, Superintendent Montgomery, go ahead. Yes, sorry. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to add to one piece that I feel that will go forward um, has been um, a combination of professional development and while the students are learning at the same time. So we have teachers that are offering to say, I'm going to do this coding lesson that I feel very comfortable with and you're welcome to, and they'll send out the link and you're welcome to join me with your class on this link. So while they're teaching the lesson to their students, they're also teaching how they're teaching it to another teacher at the same time because they can all join in virtually. So it's been a really um, creative way to embed pro pro professional development while they're also teaching. So I, I just wanted to add that piece because that's been very exciting. I think Jen might have had 150 classes join her one day on a lesson on, and it was really exciting. 
interesting to see that teachers just log in and join in and learn at the same time as, as their students in many ways. So. Trustee Moore, are you next? No, I think I was last on the list. I should have wrote down. Who's next? <laughs> Trustee Cleary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is before uh, I think uh, uh, Jennifer or, or uh, Rob could uh, could uh, join in if he if he wishes, uh, and it may be observations or just anecdotes. But uh, uh, you talk, told us uh, Jen about uh, various tools like the uh, breakout rooms and the interactive slides in uh, Pearl Desk uh, in Pearl Deck, um, and uh, it seems that that really um, helps in individualized instruction. And I was wondering with regard to special needs students who have an IEP, uh, does this, uh, does this, uh, to, do these tools really help in that situation? Have you had any feedback on how that really helps uh, teachers to, uh, to uh, uh, implement the IEP uh, even better than normal? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I think that's, that's a great point. And um, looking at a lot of the virtual tools because they're digital, Oftentimes, um, if it's a tool that the student's interacting with, you can change the level. So if it's one of our math sort of supporting programs, you can change the level to be suitable to the individual student that's working. And then some of those interactivity um, kind of apps that we showed, definitely they can appeal to different students who may have different needs. So they can be something that can really help um, with that differentiation piece in the classroom. And I, I think, again, that that will continue going forward. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, just to add to that, um, the tool Equatia that I had referred to is one of the ones that we've been emphasizing for several years now. Uh, and under that primary reason that it does make math more accessible for students, specifically with special education needs. And in, in particular, students that need to use screen readers or text to speech or speech to text. Um, EQAO has actually gone the way when some of their online assessments prior to moving to the digital platform this year were having their documents created uh, using EQAO so that they would function properly on screen readers. One of the things that screen readers have difficulty with is the ability to read mathematical equations and EQAO has it set up so that they will read seamlessly for those students. So the use of those tools has really been um, a great way to make the math more accessible for all students. And the shift to digital in the, uh, because of the pandemic has got more teachers comfortable and familiar with creating documents in that fashion, meaning we'll have more documents that are providing more accessibility for all students. Oh, great. Thank you. Trustee Moore and then Trustee Coburn. Thank you. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. I think it's probably for Rob and more than Jen. And thank you guys so much for putting spec ed right out there. I appreciate that. Uh, but I'm going to piggyback on what Trustee Curry was asking about. And you've got the home and you've got the school and, and the students working well, but what about the, the parents? Are, do you have any of those OCSB helps videos or anything to explain how these uh, read and write work and if we're equatio and that? I, I say that because as a mother of autistic children, they don't tell you if they think you already know because they know, so therefore you must know. <laughs> so I would never have heard about this. <laughs> yes, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the, there are uh, a number of OCSB help videos that are out there, uh, specifically related to uh, Equatio. I can say that for sure. I, I know those ones exist. Uh, some of the other products like the Math Space software, which is that online resource, we don't per se have uh, detailed videos on those, but we do have some videos that explain just the basics of getting started and signing in. Um, and we encourage, uh, although I know it's a difficult thing to uh, have happen, I have uh, three students that have gone through the system, one that's still finishing high school, he's in grade 11 right now, uh, to sit down with those students and have them explain the software to you or explain how they're answering these things um, in a digital environment. But uh, we really encourage that line of communication with the students because that's the best way to figure out exactly what's going on. Well, that, that's only if you did well in math. Thanks. <laughs> Trustee Coburn. Uh, first, thanks for the presentation. It was excellent. And uh, uh, I would have uh, 
I, I think I would have assumed the same that uh, one of the silver linings through the pandemic would be to a subject like math, the ability to use technology to enhance that. My question is, have we seen any empirical evidence yet with regards to results as to how students are doing with regards to math? Um, the tools you showed tonight, I think, are phenomenal. And I really see it as something that's going to enhance not only learning, but potentially results. So I'm just wondering, Rob, and or uh, if you've seen any empirical evidence with regards to results. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, the honest answer, no definitive evidence. <laughs> Uh, we did actually have some of our schools actually participate in the EQAO assessment, which had moved fully online this year. Um, anecdotal evidence from my from my own experiences, whether with my own uh, children or with classes that I've worked with them with teachers, um, the the tools really make the math more accessible, which help to it connects the different forms. So it connects the written form to the equation to the graphs. It really makes all of that. Uh, all those connections for the students. I know from a personal level with my student, with my children, when they had asked me for assistance on their math homework, I would ask them, have you graphed it on Desmos? No. I said, well, go back and graph it and then come back and ask the same question. And often they don't come back because it's really these tools that are making uh, the math come to life. So I fully expect that we will see uh, greater results moving forward as we as these tools become um, more commonplace and students and teachers become more comfortable using them. And if I could add um, through you, Mr. Chair, um, we actually anticipated this question. We talked about this when we were preparing the presentation saying, do we really know? What evidence do we have? What is the data? And we know through, as Rob said, the anecdotal evidence through teachers and the engagement of students, and that we know the evidence will come through, I'm sure, a variety, there's probably going to pile in from a variety of sources and organizations that want to collect the data that you're asking for, Trustee Coburn. But uh, yeah, and we, we certainly hear it from the teachers and from the, and the students that it's more engaging, which makes it more accessible. And, uh, and, and the goal is a more attainable <laughs> and positive. So Good. Thank you. Is there any other questions or comments? Trustee Armstrong. Uh, just to follow up with what Superintendent Montgomery was mentioning earlier, I, I'm hearing uh, an, a reinvention of the co-teaching model, uh, this time with an in-class and virtual teacher teaming up for a lesson. Is that uh, happened very prevalent, like very often? Uh, for you, Mr. Chair, it's it's happening more and more. So there's 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 especially two ways that it's happening. There's it's happening where we have somebody like a coordinator like Jen Flynn who's offering to lead and model um, a session where um, you know it's put out to the whole system. They log in and they're following along, and she's she's teaching it. So it's it's a, basically more formal. And then the other way it's happening is more organically, where we have teachers just getting together, getting together, basically, partnering and deciding to share their knowledge with each other and, and invite each other in virtually to the lesson. So there's two, there's, we're seeing the benefits of that. So we're taking it and using it more formally, but then it's also happening much more um, organically where, you know, we're not jamming kids into one classroom, they're able to join together virtually, and there's a lot of benefits to that. So, so yes, we are seeing it more, um, for sure, in those two different ways. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation. Can I have a mover, please? Trustee McEwen, seconder, Trustee Coburn. That the memorandum from the Superintendent of Student Success Elementary dated May 5th, 2021, entitled Mathematics at the OCSB in a Virtual World be received. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Item L6, memo from the Superintendent of Continuing and Community Education, Re-International Languages Program, Virtual Success. Superintendent Villati, welcome. Good evening, Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to be here this evening and to highlight some of the programs that we have in the Continuing Community Education Department. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Murphy is not available this evening due to the family situation, which requires his attention. However, um, somebody extremely well versed in our program and has 
big part of it is our manager of the Continuing and Community Education Department, Marianne Kayed. So this evening, uh, Mrs. Kayed will be sharing with you the, how the program has been operating over the past 14 to 15 months in the virtual format, uh, perhaps some of the challenges, but also some of the successes that we would also um, have been, been proud to, to receive and be sharing this evening. So I'll turn it over to Mrs. Kayed. You need to turn on your microphone, please. You're on mute. You're still on mute. There we go. Is that better? Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. So. So um, I'll take you through a few slides that we've prepared just to uh, review how the program's been running. Certainly uh, the International Language Pro Languages Program is one of the mandatory programs that continuing education offers uh, mandatory for Ministry of Education and is um, an elementary and credit program. Certainly with the move to online, um, very similar to everybody else at the board and, and certainly across Ontario, uh, we went from you know, using very little technology in the Saturday programs to uh, everybody using technology in the programs. And um, certainly a couple of the screenshots here, uh, the instructor on the left in the picture with the cat in the hat uh, face and, and hat on is one of our Spanish instructors. And certainly she was very engaged with grade one and two classes. Um, on the right hand side, the photo there, screen capture is showing a, um, a Chinese, uh, Chinese instruments concert that was being streamed in during one of the Chinese New Year celebrations for, for the grade seven and eights. And the photo at the bottom was showing, um, you know, one of the weekly lessons in our Korean program, which is very, very popular in the credit mm -hmm. program. In terms of the languages that we offer, and again, these are languages that could be spoken at home uh, by, by a particular student, or it could be a, a language just that, that they're interested in learning. So there's no uh, limitation in terms of uh, their, their language proficiency when they enter the program. We get every everybody from a beginner right up to people who are much more fluent. And certainly, um, the number of students this year has been fairly stable. We've seen about 1,900 students so far and about 371 high school students. So we've had a bit of an increase in our high school registrations this year, which is really good. Um, within that, we are uh, using fewer teachers in the online environment. So we have 94 elementary instructors teaching every Saturday and, and um, 17 credit teachers. We work, of course, with the communities in, in running these programs. Traditionally, we would be in a school um, and there would be a parent advisory group that volunteers and helps, you know, run the program, helps with, um, you know, helping, you know, run errands for, for photocopies or helping run the snack table at, at you know, the break or when there's events, that kind of thing. Uh, certainly this year, everybody's online with us and, and we've tried to maintain that sense of community working with them in terms of running some of the um, normal events like Chinese New Year or International Mother Language Day, things like that online. We've also been able to introduce some new languages, even though we have been online, and that's been really, really rewarding. So Swahili has really, really taken off. We have three classes right now running. Um, the teachers are, are really, really enthusiastic, and certainly I think that's doing a lot to, to keep that enrollment growing. And we're also getting requests occasionally from outside of Ottawa, which is really interesting because there's not that many areas in Ontario that run Swahili. So um, certainly that is one of the advantages we're seeing with online. Um, Gaelic is one of the languages we normally would run, but certainly because of low enrollment this year, we were not able to run the class. So we hope next year if enrollment picks up, we'll bring that one back. In terms of uh, the program itself, certainly um, in the elementary program, we can have continuous enrollment throughout the year. So while we do have our, our peak periods at the beginning of the term when we do registration, and certainly right now we're actually registering for, for summer, and then in a few weeks we'll start registering for fall. Um, but certainly families that move into the area uh, can register at any time during the year or when they finish 
you know, football season or whatever, hockey, you know, we get students registering in January, um, for example, or right up till May. Uh, the secondary credit program runs throughout the year, but again, because of the credit requirements, we can only register for, for the for really for, for parts of September. And then we have to close the registration, you know, in order so that students can meet their commitment for credits. The classes run every Saturday for two and a half hours in the elementary. The credit student run, credit classes run for three hours. Um, and certainly um, the instructors themselves, some are teachers uh, registered with, the, with the, the Ontario College of Teachers. Others are not. And um, it's interesting because, again, we're, you, you never know. These are people who may be fluent in their language. Maybe we're teachers in their countries who are teaching with us. But certainly we still see really, really amazing things with these, this group of part-time teachers and instructors. In terms of how did the transition work for us, uh, really it was high speed, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, the graphic on the left, of course, shows sort of what we used to do in, in schools. And, and certainly we had 11 sites that we were in and, and certainly worked very closely with the principals at each school to, to ensure that we left things in good shape and certainly worked with planning and facilities to make sure that we didn't, uh, you know, create too much of uh, interruption to their, their custodial schedules and so on. But certainly um, moving to the online has changed that so that we've actually created a virtual school and so we use a combination of Google Meets and, and Google Classroom. Google Classroom is the learning management system that uh, was identified for us, partly because it had a really easy learning curve for the instructors. And we have very, very little PD time that we can um, do with the teachers. So we, we were looking for something that would be fairly, fairly intuitive and fairly easy to, to use and certainly easy for many of the students to use. And we know that with some of the other boards in Ottawa, some of the, the, the other boards are using Google Classroom, so some students were already familiar with it. We, we try to do as much training as we can and have built in, you know, opportunities for additional training on and off, whether they were uh, a half day of training or whether it was, you know, early dismissal or, or paying people to stay an extra hour, you know, at certain times of the year to learn some of the new techniques, as well as learning how to deliver and transition a program from um, being a classroom based program to the online and and certainly also working with the, the resources that are available in the different languages that might be on the Internet and so on. And then the other piece that we had to do was um, in continuing education, the students can be from our school board. Some of them are also from other school boards. And so we um, do go through a separate registration process for our students. And part of what we need to do in order to be able to use Google Classroom is we have to create board uh, OCSB emails for our students so that we've had to um, create a whole process within the department for managing how we create and how we register and, and get the student uh, emails activated, how we get the parents involved and send them the information as well as the student, and then as well how we authorize them to access Google Classroom. In terms of what the year and a half has taught us, certainly um, a difference in terms of how the, the community works, how the schools work. Um, you know, when we were in a school, certainly we had a lot of community interaction. We were able to run multiple programs. Um, you know, multiple programs in the sense of different languages, different ages of classes, but also programs for adults were running. There were sports programs in the gym uh, with some of the communities, you know, badminton going on, uh, extra community activities in the gym after the classes and so on. Um, with the online, that isn't happening. Um, but again, people are, are managing with that and families are not too uh, severely impacted, I don't think, so far with it. But of course, looking forward to when schools do reopen. Um, the technology training for staff, of course, was a major uh, piece and certainly we were very uh, hands on and tried to bring in people who had experience already using some of the tools that we were using to give them techniques about how to to modify their training for, for online delivery and remote delivery, and, and especially for different age groups. Um, certainly parents ended up also learning some of the new resources with us and how to use some of the tools and how to respond to Google Classroom and how to get, especially for JK, SK, uh, and the younger children, trying to get them uh, set up for their lessons on Saturday. Um, it certainly meant reviewing the role of the administrators. Traditionally in a school, we would have a site administrator at each site and they would be, you know, not just doing registrations and things, but they would be interfa interfacing with parents, um, supervising the teachers, um, you know, basically 
administering what happens in that school and who comes into the building. In the online, of course, the role has changed. There's not so much supervision uh, or doing registration, but much more um, online interaction between the, the, the parents and the students and also much more opportunity to observe what's happening in classrooms. So that, that's a slight change. And certainly we've tried to actually create a, a different task list for, for the look for is that the, the site administrators should be covering every Saturday. Um, and certainly more of the, role, the, the registration and administration work has been centralized at the board office. Um, Hands-on cultural components are done differently. Again, our big festivals, when we would have things like uh, Chinese New Year or when we would have the Spring Festival with the Russian community or things like that. Of course, those aren't uh, happening except in the virtual format. But surprisingly, we were still seeing some really interesting things happen and, and certainly um, places where they're, you know, the, the community groups and the linguistic groups will bring in different members of the community to demonstrate crafts and, and the teachers will have the children doing crafts or, or they'll bring in, you know, musical entertainment or have the children doing exercise breaks and so on. So they, they try to keep it lively and the two and a half hours goes by fairly quickly. Um, so Mr. Mr. Chair, just to be cognizant of time and to respect everyone's yes. uh, schedule this evening, I'll yeah. ask uh, Mrs. Kaya just to wrap it up. Okay. And certainly... I mentioned the parents, uh, staff preparation. Again, you know, we also had to uh, to adjust our, our schedule so that the actual contact time on Saturdays is a little bit less, but certainly that allows the teachers to have more prep time. And, um, you know, certainly we're monitoring the language acquisition process and how that's changing in the different environment with, uh, with the online and, and, um, and, and still seeing, you know, some really good production of language happening and cultural experiences. So I, that is the last of our slides and, and certainly Mr. Chair, um, we're open to questions. Thank you very much. Questions or comments? Trustee Curry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to um, Mary Hanna. Uh, I was wondering, um, and this could apply before or, or in this virtual year, or maybe it doesn't apply at all. Uh, are resources available on all of these 21 languages? Is it is getting appropriate resources uh, for any of the languages a problem, or are the resources pretty much there, um, uh, even now online, I suppose? But are, are resources available in all these various languages? For many of them, we have, uh, all, you know, certainly the internet has has many resources that are available. Uh, we've tried to review some of them, and certainly the site administrators help us in vetting the materials as well as some of the parent groups. Um, you know, certainly for suitability, um, and certainly because we don't always, because we don't speak all these languages, we, we it's it's more challenging for us to try to do that vetting. Um, we do see teachers creating a lot of the materials again because they don't find things that are are adaptable for a second language learner in that language. Um, but certainly, yeah, we're we're seeing a lot of really interesting things. The Swahili group, for example, doesn't have much material, so that the teachers that are involved in the program are actually creating a lot of materials, and they've created a website and, you know, are sharing their materials with, with I guess, other other people in other programs across the country. So. Um, yeah, it is a bit of a challenge. Google Classroom is only in English. We're not able, it's not the type of learning management system that we can change the language interface of, but uh, certainly many of the teachers are familiar enough with working with the parents to how to adapt their, their operating systems and things like that. Oh, okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Trustee Armstrong? Through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, more of just a shout out. I was excited to see uh, one of your international language program instructors. I hope I'm saying it right. Ping Zhu um, got a Director of Education Commendation Award for 2021. So I just wanted to, to mention yes. that. Thank yes, you. thank you. It yeah. created great excitement. And uh, she's from the St. Joseph's High School site. And uh, certainly they, everybody's been thrilled. That, that she's been recognized yeah. for that because she's been yeah. very, very hardworking in the program. Thank you. Is there any other questions or comments?
Thank you very much, Marianne, for the presentation. <clears throat> Can I have a mover, please? Okay, thank you. Trustee Warren. Seconded by Trustee Armstrong. The memorandum from the Superintendent of Continuing and Community Education dated May 6, 2021, entitled International Languages Program, Program Ritual Success Be Received. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, item L7, Memo from the Superintendent of Finance Administration. Read 2021-2022, preliminary budget information. Welcome, Superintendent Schumanns. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, everyone. This evening. Uh, last Tuesday, May 4th, the ministry announced uh, the grant student needs through 10 memorandums, some other uh, communication detail in order to confirm some numbers as well as we are very pleased that uh, they released the EPIS forms, the grant calculation forms, right away. So that was, that was uh, welcomed, uh, welcomed information. Our finance staff are currently working on calculating and analyzing the impacts of these announcements so that we'll have those ready to provide to you next meeting. So we'll have a more detailed um, analysis and explanation of the grants, but I thought I'd give you just a, a few tidbit highlights tonight um, in advance of next meeting. So from the operating grant side of it, there's some good news and there's some newly announced complexities that we're just um, working our, our way through, talking about some of the, the most significant uh, size grants. I would uh, speak to some stability that they're putting in place for the English as a Second Language grant that's provided through the GSNs, um, and that will provide us with some stability um, in the range of approximately $2 million for our board. Additionally, um, there is an announcement. We are pleased to see that there's some temporary COVID grants announced, similar to what we had received late last August. Um, they are confirming that for the 2021-22 school year. So for our board, those COVID grants total approximately $9.9 .9 million from the memo. Of that, $6.5 million goes towards staffing supports. But I mentioned there's some complexity in budgeting for next year. Some of that complexity is we're only allowed to budget for 50% of those grants next year. So we're just working it out now how we match that 50% to um, to our expenses and our staffing for next year. So stay tuned in that area. Some of the other routine grants that uh, we would have expected is 2% increase for um, CPI on school operations grants. So that would cover primarily um, service contracts and utilities. So that will generate us approximately $600,000. However, they are phasing in, they continue to phase in some clawback in that same school operations area. So we're, we will be up six and we'll be down three. Um, there are a few positions, 162,000 that will be continued mental health funding that we're receiving in the current year and will now be folded in permanently. So that's good news. Um, there's some tech funding that's going to be folded in permanently into the grants. It will be a, a little over 300,000 for our board. That's good news. And additionally, last but not least, they are doubling the programs um, from 24,000 to 48,000 next year. So some good news coming out of um, from that grant announcement. They also provided for some new reporting requirements. So um, there will be some enveloping, some new enveloping around our Indigenous education grants, as well as our library grants. So again, we are digging into those details so that we'll have something to report for next meeting. So finance will work hard on this um, and put a package together for the agenda. But for tonight, we have some preliminary schedules that are for other revenue and our department budgets that provide some significant numbers. There may be some slight changes in future meetings, but um, we'll provide some significant information. So I'm just going to turn to, I'll ask you to click into your preliminary H3 other revenue. And I will do the same as you do that. There we go. So on this schedule, um, obviously 
the $15 million total on this schedule represents only about 3% of our overall revenues with the, the, the majority of our, our grants coming, our funding coming from grants. So the schedule totals $15.144 million. Um, if you compared it to the current year's budget, we would be at 19.9 million. So we're down about $4.8 million in other revenues from the current year. There will be some additions added when we update this because there will be um, some student support funds, PPFs that are one-time grants that will be added to the updated schedule of about $600,000. They're still calculating that number um, and it requires a carryover. So we'll have that confirmed. The adult, the non-credit English as a second language program um, at $2.6 million is a reduction. It's down about $564,000 from the current year and down a million dollars from two years prior. So that's reflective of the, the pandemic and the enrollments within that program. If I move you down the page to the individual section, you will see that the extended day program or EDP is showing a revenue of $5.6 million. That's down from $9.9 million in the current year. So a significant reduction of over $4 million. Um, the $5.6 million is being budgeted for in next year's budget to provide for all sites to return <clears throat> to opening. So all 44 sites will be open. You'll recall that 12 sites were put on pause this year. There has been um, an adjustment in the enrollment projections within that, uh, that provisional budget, as well as some analysis and some pencil sharpening on the staffing allocation side of it. So that revenue is reflective of similar type of expenses on the other side. It is a cost recovery program, but it will be coming in at about $250,000 short. So um, that's, a, that's a reasonable expectation for next year with the enrollments holding. Moving a little further down the page, um, one other item that uh, I can reference is just in the tuition fee section. Um, we're showing reduction in our tuition fees overall of about 431,000. And again, that's just reflective of the pandemic um, and we expect those to gradually return over the next year and in future years. So that is uh, just a summary of the other revenues. Now I'm going to ask you to click in and turn to the G schedule. So I'm, when I'm referencing that, I'm referencing the G, uh, the G schedule that's not the narratives, G1. So the G1 schedule represents our department budgets. That's approximately 15% of our overall budget. So 85% of our budget is salaries and benefits, and that's what finance and HR is working hard on right now to finalize as the, the staffing process is, is, is underway and um, the timelines are being for, are coming, coming forth. So within the G1 schedule, you'll see one, two, three, four, five columns. So what those columns are doing is they're taking it from the current year's approved budget in the first column, 2020-2021 budget, an increase or decrease to get it to the current year's revised budget. And that's actually the one we had to file with the ministry mid-year. So that is what we're operating at a baseline budget for the current year. And then in the fourth column, we increase and decrease that baseline to get to next year's budget. And you'll see at the top of that column, it says preliminary budget for next year, 2021-22. So I'll just briefly walk through some of the, um, the highlights on that particular change for next year's budget. So when I'm looking at it, I'll reference the page in the column. So if we're moving down um, the first page, you'll see at the bottom of the first page in the fourth column down, school budgets, an increase of 105,588, that says. So that's reflective of simply just our enrollment. So the school budgets remain the same and they are being adjusted for the approximately 900 additional students that are projected to come into the system next year. 
we turn over to page two and we go about three quarters of the way down the page, you'll see the learning technologies budget. And overall, it's showing an adjustment of 845,000. And that's just reflective of the, you know, there's uh, a number of pluses and minuses on those columns because it's moving between different departments within learning technology. But overall, what's happening in that budget is in the current year, in order to balance our budget, we had withdrawn a million dollars from the LT budget. And for the 2021-22 budget, we're returning that to the baseline budget. So that's a significant adjustment. We flip over to page three um, and we move mid page. We look at the er early learning services section and we'll see in the third column that that's being increased to 1.5 million in adjustment after the current year shutdown for a total of $3 million for the expenses. And as I mentioned in the other revenue section, um, the EDP program will be, is being budgeted to run for all 44 sites at full capacity with a small $250,000 shortfall. So we're hopeful that all those numbers uh, of enrollment come through in the fall. And then last but not least, moving to the last page, about one third down the page, we'll see the Ottawa Student Transportation Authority and that budget is moving up to 26,790,000. Um, and that's reflective of the contractual arrangements within the OSTA budget. So for this schedule G1, it's reflective of those types of costs that are basically beyond the control of the individual departments because they have to increase it for CPI increases in contracts, for something that's already been contractually settled like transportation, um, rate increases that are projected for utilities, for example. We received an increase in our insurance bill um, and known increases or decreases in the interest on the debt. So the schedule of before you shows what we must include in our budget just to move forward on a baseline. At the next meeting, we'll update this schedule for all of those other items that, um, that are reflective of the grant announcements. And additionally, we will be bringing you schedules on salaries and benefits. So 85% of the budget, um, including full-time equivalent, as well as a summary of the calculations for the grants for student needs and a memo that outlines the changes on that. At this time, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Trustee Moore. Thank you, three, Mr. Chair. Um, Superintendent, I was looking at the top of page three, so priorities and partnership funds. So it's right at the very top. It's this um, after school skills development for ASD and the graduation coach program for black students. Uh, neither of them have been funded yet, but are we, they still on the line just in case they are funded or if we've heard that they're not being funded? So thank you, thank you Mr. Chair. That's a very good question. And it's actually something that um, I just reviewed again uh, today. So the after school skill development program is actually being folded into the grants for student need. Oh, so that's good news. It is good news. So it, it's normally a PPF and it's being folded into the GSN. So this is one of the examples of the timing. So at the updated schedule, you'll see something more reflective on that line. That's good news for that line. The graduation coach program for black student has been included in the PPF memo that has been announced, but our amount has not been announced. Um, so oh. we're still waiting on that announcement and we're hopeful that by May 31st, we'll have all of the remaining PPF announcements to be able to include it in the final budget. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a supplemental? Go ahead. Okay, number seven, it's on the very last page, health and safety. There's a 500,000 plus dollars decline in uh, the health and safety from what it was this year. Yes. Thank you through Mr. Chair. Uh, so the 565,000 is representative of 500,000 and some other adjustments um, on that, de that department budget, but 
500,000 of that is reflective of it included 500,000 for PPE in, in our original budget for the current year. And then of course, subsequent to that, the ministry announced that they were funding the PPE. So it's no longer required for a move forward year. And the ministry is committed to that the next year as well. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Trustee Armstrong. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the OSTA budget, um, we, we see that there's an increase of uh, almost a, a bit over $3 million. Um, transportation, we know, is getting more and more expensive every year we go forward. Um, is there a possibility or do you foresee any changes to the model for transportation delivery coming down the pipeline? Thank you to you, Mr. Chair. And that's a very good question. Um, it's one of the questions that we had as risk areas when we were waiting for the grants for student needs to be announced. Um, that is specifically referenced within the GSN memos that were announced last week. Um, that they are, or they do, have the transportation model under review. However, they chose to pause on it for a further year and continue with the transportation grants as is. That's so, good to know. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation. Can I have a mover, please? Trustee Coburn and Trustee Simpson. That the memorandum from the Superintendent of Finance and Administration dated May 5th, 2021, entitled 2021-2022 Preliminary Budget Information and Accompanying Budget Documentation be received. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. There's no new business. There's no notice of motions. Can I get a mover for the confirmation of the action report of April 27, 2021, please? Trustee Curry and Trustee Moore, that the action report covering the period of April 27, 2021 be received. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, Director D'Amico, any uh, announcements? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, just one announcement. You'll notice on the board's main website today on our blog, there's a wonderful uh, feature on student trustee Namir Goni and the award that re she received from Air Canada. So that's today's featured blog. And I'll just read one, one line from the blog. Uh, Namir is an OCSB student trustee and founder of the first Black Student Association at St. Pius X High School. She truly has made a difference within her school and her community, inspiring her peers and educators along the way. And I know that two trustees have received a copy of the video. So I just wanted to publicly congratulate Namir for this recognition. Thank you and congratulations, Namir. I know Namir was having problems with her camera earlier, so we'll congratulate her in person, or not in person, virtually in person, face-to-face. -face. How, how do you want to say it at the next meeting? Okay, it's that time of night at 9.32. Can I have a motion to adjourn, please? Trustee McEwen and Trustee Spencer, or Warren, That the regular board meeting of May 11th, 2021 be adjourned at 9.32 p.m. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Long one, lots of presentations, but lots of information too. So thank you very much, everybody, for 